No matter if points are gained or points are lost, there will be much to discuss. For analysis regarding tonight's Winnipeg Jets game, here are Dave Manouk, Ezra Ginsberg, and your host, Drew Mendel. The Illegal Curve post-game show starts now. Good afternoon, Winnipeg. Good afternoon, Manitoba. For all those joining us live this afternoon on our social media platforms, we say good afternoon, universe, and welcome to both my childhood bedroom and the Illegal Curve post-game show. Along with Dave Manouk, I'm your host, Drew Mindell, here to talk about another dispiriting, disappointing result for the Winnipeg Jets. They lose again their third straight game, dropping a 5-1 decision to the Colorado Avalanche going down in the playoff series, three games to one. You can't help but feel, Dave Manouk, that the end is near for this Winnipeg Jets team. Of course, they're going to give it all they can on Tuesday night, and not to say that they can't win on Tuesday night, but boy, oh boy, is the mountain steep for them to climb. And pardon the pun, but the avalanche is heading down that hill. Good afternoon, sir. Good to see you. Good to see you, Drew. Good to see the good folks here in the chat. Thanks for joining us again for another edition of the Illegal Curve Post Game Show. This is what Drew are. Well, let's do some math. Eighty six, <laughs> I think, uh, of the season. But uh, yes, sir. Yeah, it's been uh, it's it's a tough one. I can understand why Jets fans are fired up. You know they. They didn't like the start. They would have been a little happier with the, the end of the first period. They would have been a little bit happier with the fact that, you know, their team came out in the middle frame and started off, you know, I thought pretty well, but what was the one thing? And, and folks, you don't have to like the penalty calls. I agree. Some of them were ticky tack, some of them were marginal. And, you know, given the fact that Neil Pionk almost lost his head to Yakov Trenin yesterday or in two days ago yeah. in game three, on what should have been an interference and wasn't an interference. And don't get me wrong that the Avs could point out plays where the Jets had calls that were not called against them. But, you know, if you're co- look, comparing apples to apples, like, you know, I don't see how Pionk almost losing his head is not interference. And yet what Logan Stanley did a lot closer to what I would say is where the puck was, is called an interference. So you don't like some of the calls, but at the same time is that the refs, you have to figure out what the standard is that the refs are are calling. And ultimately, the penalty kill does the Jets in again, right? You've got two power play goals that really turn this game on its head, ultimately. So, you know, that, that's not a good place for them to be. Uh, is, oh, the chat's saying I'm quiet here, Drew. I'm sorry, I'm just seeing your thing, but I shouldn't be quiet. I'm on my full, pretty much my full volume, folks. So uh, Okay, so maybe it was just a one time. Maybe it was a one-off that your mic might have been a little it bit. It could have just been because I was, I, was trying to, I was trying to start the thing measured and re- and relaxed. So if the I chat see. thinks I'm quiet, give me a, you know, or too quiet or, or good volume, I want the chat to let me know. But look, I, I think that, you know, this is a game, Drew, that there were a lot of things that, that, came into play, especially in that second period, right? The discipline issue was, was an issue again. And we said, what did we say going into this game? We said that you could not have a a game where you're in the penalty box against the fifth best power play in the NHL all season long. Remember, we're supposed to ignore what happens during the regular season, unless it's relevant to our discussion. And in this instance, it's relevant to our discussion. So the jets, of course, giving the Avs, all they needed, and I, I, a lot of the couple of things I thought of, and just quickly, I'll, I'll spit them off. Too many guys came into the jet zone unmolested, or even into the neutral zone. I couldn't believe how many times if you watched it in reverse when the Jets are trying to press, the Avs were hitting them every chance they got. The mm-hmm. Avs hit, made them pay. It's like a war of attrition, right? You, you made them pay for every inch that they tried to gain. And I didn't see the Jets reciprocating that. I'm not saying the Jets never hit anybody, the hits weren't even that. Uh, out of range it was like 31 24 at one point when i was watching or when i checked it on nhl.com but my point is that the jets had to earn every inch of ice that they achieved and they didn't achieve a lot and that the abs did not have to sort of similarly uh earn that and the last thing i would say the last thing i really noticed my last takeaway it's the last thing you're gonna say we're only five minutes (laughs) into this post game what am i gonna do for the next 55 minutes in my initial preamble okay is that my the the thought I had was the Avs clogged the lanes. The Avs didn't get to let the Jets get shots through the middle, through the ice, and onto Gorgiev. So that was a huge uh, thing that they were able to do is really kind of limit 
Winnipeg's chances. And I haven't checked the high danger chances, how they finished off in the game. I'm sure wow. you'll let the, let the folks know ultimately, but like I said, discipline, you know, the physicality and ultimately the shot, shot quality, I thought were, were three of the biggest things that stood out to me in this hockey game. And we'll talk about individual performances and the ghosts of Sean Monaghan, Tyler DeFoley, Gabriel Velarde, uh, you know, so that to me, there's guys who needed to step up, you know, Kyle Connor, Mark Shifley and Nikolai Ehlers. Like, you know, I'm not going to blame Axel Janssen Fielby who, you know, he got a boost in the third but, period. I mean, look, I mean, I, I mean, that's the, as far as I'm concerned, you're, they're just they're, they're, the desperation is evident that there are no answers that the Jets don't have any answers when they call up Axel Janssen Fialbi from the Manitoba Moose and think that he's going to be the panacea for for all. And by that the way, ails them. didn't play him on the penalty kill. That's right. And so they exactly you're you're calling <laughs> I think him they up did eventually, but. Yeah, you're calling him up allegedly because, you know, to play on the penalty kill. He did not play one second of PK time in the course of today's game. Uh, he had seven <laughs> no. seconds of power play time, for God's sakes. Well, and I, I will play say him on the PK. Well, I mean, think about it. They got those useless power plays in the third when it, when it doesn't matter. That's the, that's the best part. So the rest can say, mm -hmm. well, look at the power plays. It's like, well, no, you gave the Jets power plays when it was completely out. The game was already over at that point. But, right. I mean, look, the Jets didn't explicitly say they were calling actually on some be up for, for PK opportunities. I'm just saying that that would have been kind of one of the thought processes was that, you know, you guys, you know, they right. say you got to be able to do multiple but, things. So that's one thing. But I, do. I, you know, I, making that decision and look, I, I mean, we, there's no reason to spend a lot of time on it because it's not that that was the difference in the game. But yeah. to me, Jared Bednar has badly outcoached Rick Bonus in this series. And sure. the decision to all of a sudden elevate Axel Janssen Fialbi from the Manitoba Moose for this game just reeks of the similar desperation. Remember when Paul Maurice decided to bring Dmitry Kulikov in for game five? Oh, instead of Enstrom. Instead of Enstrom. Which, by the way, pissed Enstrom off. He hasn't been back in Winnipeg or hasn't been had, had anything to do with the organization since then. But yeah. to me, that's just a, a coach who's completely desperate and doesn't have an answer for what ails his team. Jared Bednar has, has been the better of the two coaches in this yeah. series. Now it's easy to be the better of the two coaches when you have Nathan McKinnon and you have Kale McCarr and you have Miko Rantanen and you have Val Nachushka, no question about it. But Rick Bonus certainly has not, uh, I think stood on his head by any stretch of the imagination with any of the coaching decisions that he's made in this series. But ultimately it, it, it didn't matter. I mean, you can't, if you're the Winnipeg Jets, you're, you're, it's a big mountain to climb regardless, but it's 2-1 in the series. You know, you need to have a great performance in tonight's game to be yeah. competitive. That means you take, you know, they got away with taking the first two penalties and without and getting for scored the record, on. I will give them credit. Their PK was very good. To start. To, in the first period, yeah. when they took the penalty. Yeah. Like, who was it? Was it Lowry? Took no, they were both Logan Stanley. Logan yeah, Stanley. Sorry, Logan Stanley. Penalties. In That's the right. second so, period, early in the yeah. second period, within the first six uh, six minutes of the period, Logan Stanley takes the back-to-back -back penalties. There. Sorry. So, so, but I, both those penalty kills, I, in my head, I'm watching this. I'm like, okay, this is going right. to be a turning point again. Right. But they were very good on the PK. Well, I, I have a note about those two penalty kills here. As I look at people, I take notes and everything else. Wow, look at, look just, at Drew being a good old host. It's not just chicken scratch either. You can actually read some of these notes, but it was they seemed like they were more aggressive uh, on the puck carrier. As soon as they gained the line, the Jets PK appeared to be more, uh, more aggressive in trying to disrupt things before the avalanche could, could set up. Yeah. Now, you know, obviously you get, you get away with the first, let's say penalty and a half because then Nathan McKinnon took that penalty on Vlad Nemesnikov mm -hmm. to nullify uh, the rest of that second power play. Right. And of course, we don't yet have an update on Vlad Nemesnikov. Uh, my understanding is this was according to Corey Massasak, uh, who covers the Colorado Avalanche for the Denver Post, mm -hmm. is that uh, he, Vlad Nemesnikov was being transported to hospital in oh. Denver. If you missed it or if you're just joining us late now, uh, Nemesnikov took a shot right off of what looked like the cheek, the face, tons of blood on the ice. Not a not a good looking scene, and we wish him nothing but the best of course it certainly looked it looked bad on the ice um and i'm sure it, it hurt and i don't think it but i don't think it's going to be end up being 
uh, you know, my, the first thought that came to my mind when you saw him down like that was Brian Little. That was the first thought that came to my mind. Yeah. We remember Brian Little's career ending, uh, you know, slap shot to the head. Uh, yeah, we have a more recent example. Be- we have an example of that just recently in the, with the Moose where Tyrell Boward was in practice, got a, a, a Christian Reichel shot to the back of the neck. There he was you hit go. right here. And he was down similar to Nemestikov and not moving. The not moving right. part is, not is moving the scary, scary part because yeah. you're like, why is he not moving? Is that, did it catch him in the neck? You know, you see him in the face and you're like, it's still, you know, could be his eye, but uh, you're, you're hopeful that maybe it was a cheek. But regardless, you hope for all the best for Vlad Domestikov. That's right. You you wish him nothing but the best. There's no question about that. And if there's an update coming on him, uh, we'll bring it to you here live on the Illegal Curve post game show. I'm sure. I think I saw Bailey, the intern, in the chat. So I'm sure Bailey will also. Uh, She'll mention. be monitoring. Yeah, Bailey's always good at monitoring the post game comments. But back to the start of the game. The Jets need. You know that in the first, you know, games two and three, you've been badly outplayed. You've been badly outchanced. You've been badly. Just you, the, the abs have controlled the game. The Jets need to find a way to to come out with a better start and really just slow everything down. And mm-hmm. what happens in the first 10 minutes of the game? They get absolutely caved in. And if it's not for Connor Hellebuck making a number uh, of quality saves early in the first period, within the first 10 minutes of the first period, when the shots were 11 to 1, for the Colorado Avalanche, it's probably game over uh, before the game, before the first 10 minutes uh, of the period are up. Connor Hellebuck holds the Jets in the game. He yeah. keeps them competitive in that first period. And, you know, the Jets are, you know, not to say fortunate, but yeah, to some extent, they're fortunate uh. to get out of that first period tied up at one. They get an opportunistic goal on one of their only scoring chances in the first. Colorado had already opened the scoring, of course, and we'll get into all the goals and everything. But it's just disheartening to see that that's the start that the Jets have because we talked about it yesterday morning on the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. You know, how are the Jets going to prove they're more than they were last year when they went out meekly to the mm-hmm. Vegas Golden Knights in, in five games, when they were just, when it, when it was over before almost that game five started? Well, to do that, you have to make sure that you're, they are for game four and they weren't there to start game four. Connor Hellebuck was, and anyone who thinks that Connor Hellebuck, again, let me reiterate this. If you think that Connor Hellebuck has been the problem for the Jets in this series, I don't know what to tell you aside from the fact you are wearing some sort of blinders on regarding the Jets goaltender's performance. He's the only reason this is a close game. And then you're going to look at his stats and you might throw his, his numbers at me today and say, the Jets need more from their goaltending watch the game and tell me that Connor Hellebuck's the problem. And I just don't really, I have no, I have no argument against you because you're not willing to listen to reason. That's how many goals, how many goals can Connor Hellebuck score? He, as the far Jets as scored, I know, the, the Jets scored one. Yeah. So, I mean, again, you look, you can argue all you want. Two of the goals, let, let, and let, forget about the empty net goal, but right. two of the goals that changed the, 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 the nature of this game were, or at least one of them for sure was the power play goal. Right. And then you had two. So, I mean, that is, again, that, let's, put it, let's put it this way. The Jets are the eighth least, were the eighth least penalized team in the regular season. Mm-hmm. And I mentioned this on yesterday's show. They've now given up six goals on 15 chances. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You don't have to be a mathematician. But if you do the math on that, it's not good. It's around 40%. That's really bad. Really bad. So what was the key? What was one of the keys we talked about? Don't the take penalties. Is, don't take penalties. We said don't that in penalties. we said that on Saturday, and uh, like I know, look, guys, the Jets. What did they average in a game, Drew? I mean, again, like I said, they didn't take a lot of penalties over the course of the year. So, and and part of that also is because their PK wasn't very good, so you didn't want them to be taking penalties. So that was a you know a key motivator. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you know this this Jets team they did themselves in. Now again, we have to credit Colorado because they're a hell of a good hockey team still, right? And and again, that's one of the things I think sometimes gets lost in the shuffle of these conversations is you're talking about the Jets not not elevating. And I, look, there's no question about it. That's a that's a part of this conversation. That's a part of this dialogue because there are a number of players who are not elevating their game sufficiently to offset what the Avs are doing. But you have to credit what the Colorado Avalanche are doing. Like I think they showed a graphic on the on the uh, during the game about what the depth 
of you're getting in terms of the scoring from Colorado, right? Mm -hmm. Lekkanen, Nikushian, like all these guys are stepping up and producing. It's not just McKinnon. It's not just McCarr. It's not just Rantanen. So, and obviously they don't have Drouin. So, I mean, this is, this is a team that's, you know, understanding their limitation, right? Yorgiev isn't, a, a, you know, like, let's be realistic. When we did the series preview, Drew, when we talked about it, we weren't giving the jet, the abs, the advantage in net. And we would say, having watched four games now of this series, that the abs collectively as a whole, as a five man unit out there have tried to limit the exposure of your yeb and 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 that's obviously a, a decision this team's made and then they counterattack and they usually have created some good opportunities so anyways it, it it's been an interesting series that's all i'm saying rick bonus is addressing the media in denver right now and i'll bring you some of the choice quotes as some of the reporters on site are doing us uh, a favor by tweeting them out uh mm -hmm. you know here's what rick bonus had to say uh this is courtesy of megan angley who of course was on the show last night the uh, dvnr avalanche uh quote you want adjustments stay out of the box manage the puck better i mean stay out of the box is is, is pretty straightforward for the winnipeg jets if you stay out of the box in today's game yeah, you know, really, you're one one. You're one one after 20 minutes because you stayed out of the box in the first period. Then you start to play with fire, and you take the two early penalties, and you know you get away with one of them, and then another one is nullified by the McKinnon penalty, as I mentioned. But then you don't learn your lesson. The Jets are the the kid who keeps testing and putting his hand on the element yeah. to see if it's hot, <laughs> and guess what? It eventually got hot, and then as a you you just can't afford to take those penalties. And I know that some of them are probably on the soft side. And I know that you might not like some of the calls. Both you ways, by the way, both ways. Sure. Sure. I mean, there you were calls against, there were calls against the abs that I was just like, really? I mean, even the, even the McKinnon, when he knocked, um, the stick. Yeah. Right. Like, I mean, I, again, Nick McKinnon's a smart player. So again, you don't put it past him, but like I said, same as the Stanley one, I would have liked to have just let them play, but the uh, refs did not get the memo of, this is playoff hockey. Let them play. When asked about Cole Perfetti as an option for the Winnipeg Jets, quote, we'll make some lineup changes, said Jets head coach Rick Bonus. So, you know, what does that mean precisely? Does that mean Cole Perfetti is going to be in the lineup for game five? I don't know, but it certainly sounds like a possibility. But my problem with that, Dave, mm -hmm. is I think it's too little too late. It's like when they were trying to pull Laurent Brossois in the third period of the game. You, you, you're pulling, you're down 4-1. You have a late power play opportunity when Arturi Lekkonen takes the hooking penalty or Jack Johnson takes the tripping penalty. At this point, you're down 4-1. Lekkonen takes the penalty with 12 minutes to go in the game. Jack Johnson takes the penalty with seven minutes to go in the game. You're down by three goals already. Who the hell cares if yeah. you get scored on into an empty net at that point? You're already yeah. down by three. What does it matter if you're down by four? And, That's and when being you need four, to... and being at four two, obviously, right? At, with four... twelve minutes to go, is a lot different than being four two with three minutes to go. Uh, it, it's again, again. That's it, it's a, and I like Rick Bonus as a coach, but I think that is a, it's an older mind, an older hockey man mindset that no, you can't pull your goalie down three goals with twelve minutes to go. How could you do that? That's sacrilege to the game where we've seen it happen where other coaches are more willing to make that. You we saw it happen in Winnipeg when Rod Brindamore did it as a as the head coach of the Carolina Hurricanes uh two years ago. Remember that sterling comeback that the Hurricanes made when they were down three goals to the Winnipeg Jets and they were aggressive with some of their decisions uh you know with at that point in time. So, you know, to me, it's just, and then pulling Brassois with three minutes to go and they're waiting until there's the perfect amount of dump in or the puck mm -hmm. is perfectly deep in order to do it. Again, it just seemed like they're playing for window dressing as opposed to really trying to come back into the game. Because if you're, if you get a goal at the 12 minute mark, when you're on the power play and you score six on four there and it's four, two at that point in time. Well, you know, 4-2, 12 minutes to go. Stranger things have happened. 4-2 with three minutes to go to your point. It ain't coming back, folks. It just isn't. Not the way that Colorado has played in this game. Not the way the Jets have played in the series. It's not a way that it's going to come back. So to me, 
you know, another example of how Rick Bonus has maybe both been outcoached by Jared Bednar and is complicating situations unnecessarily in, you know, for, for whatever reason, Dave. Yeah, I mean, like, I think, I, look, I'll agree with Rick Bonus on one thing. They did themselves in. Yeah. I mean, you just, we, we talked about it and you have to recognize, like one of the things I said is you can disagree with the penalties. And like I said, I think you have to be fair and realize that, you know, the ads got called with marginal penalties. Oh, well, I'm just calling, talking about throughout this series and, and misses have occurred throughout. I mean, look, I don't know how they miss. It's a five on four for the jets. Sean Monaghan gets a cross check to the face. face. Yeah. And they don't, I mean, how do you, you you have four officials presumably watching the play because there's Mm -hmm. the puck there. So, right. and I understand, don't get me wrong, it's in tight in the scrum. You might think, oh, was it the puck? Like they discussed in the broadcast, but there's going to be misses throughout the, the point. You know what? You know what's easier to have happen though? Don't be in that situation in the first place. I mean, if you're Logan Stanley, and again, I'm not blaming him for the interference one, the second interference penalty, because I, I just don't agree with that being an interference. I think that's a stupid penalty. If you're, again, if you're, if you're, if your standard is the Jakob Trennan hit on Neil Pionk without the puck is not interference then Logan Stanley's, uh, I mean, cross-check, whatever you want to call it, isn't a penalty to my mind either. But ultimately, if you recognize that the refs are going to be using a, a, like a little bit more of a ticky-tack standard, right. well, then you've got to be cognizant of the fact that, hey, our PK sucks. <laughs> we have not, again, despite the fact that it looked good in the first period, but this is Colorado we're talking about. This is an elite power play. And well, so I, you... I, yeah. No, I'm just saying, so from my perspective, you just have to recognize and what, how does this game change? I mean, look, this is another, it's a one all game after 20 minutes. You, you, you fell asleep. Connor Hellebuck was excellent through the first, I mean, shots were, shots were nine, one at one point, 11, 11, 11, one, then it was Mm -hmm. 12, two. And why was it 12, two? Because the Jets literally, I think it was Logan Stanley took a shot 200 feet from behind the net, (laughs) banked off the, off the boards and hit Yorgiev's uh, pads. And so that was the second Jets shot. My point is the Jets were completely being outclassed, as you said, to start the show to Drew. And then and they turned it around. And then they looked like they were in it. And then they start to control the play. They got yeah. the benefit of the power play, obviously. They didn't give up a shot. I mean, it, again, the Avs had a 12-3 advantage. And then it ended, the period ended 12-9. So the Jets, right. the Jets were able to do what they needed to do, which was control the play, yeah. get opportunities, create some things, score a goal. You know, Nate Schmidt gets, gets his, his first of the playoffs, first wearing a Jets jersey. And, but then like we talked about and, and coming out hard again in that second, but the penalties derailed them. The abs took control of the game. And at that point it was already over and you start thinking, okay, well now it's time to focus on game five. Uh, and that's exactly it. I mean, the jets just, I mean, they continue to do the same, make the same mistakes and continue to shoot themselves in the foot repeatedly. And I understand that playing against Colorado and playing against, you know, McKinnon and Nichushkin and and their superstars is a difficult task and you have to play perfect against them. And I think if we've learned anything so far through the first four games of the playoffs uh, of this series, it's that depth is wonderful in the regular season depth is just a privilege and a thrill to have in the regular season, but push comes to shove come playoff time. You need superstars. Depth only takes you so far. And that's what you're seeing from Colorado. They have the superstars that the jets don't. And it's probably a bit of a wake up call for Kevin shovel day off to, you know, when he looks at the team, not that I expect that there's going to be, full-scale changes but you Mm -hmm. look at the Winnipeg Jets and you say okay look we've got some nice pieces here we've got some significant pieces it's not you know but but our defense is not good enough how many of the Jets defenders today Dave you know how many of the Jets defensemen do you think could play for the Colorado Avalanche you know would have been in the Avalanche top six Morrissey for sure yeah DeMello I think probably Samberg Samberg maybe Maybe, that's it. but that's it. I mean, you know, you, it, it, and that's the reality of it. Nate Schmidt is not one of the top six defensemen on a Stanley Cup contender. And, that, you know, this is no, this is not trying to be insulting. Logan Stanley, again, I've been saying this for years. We know what Logan Stanley is. Logan Stanley is a big body. He's not particularly physical. When he tries to be physical, he often uh, puts himself out of position. And as soon as he's out of position, he goes 
for and tries to grab a defender or grab a player rather than get back into position and properly defend. We know that Logan Stanley is at this point in time better suited as a seven and eight and nine somewhere where he's not, you're not relying on him uh, as significantly. Dylan Sandberg, still young player, everything else. I'm, you know, the, 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 there's, there's a bright future there. I thought this was actually Neil Pionk's best game of the series in that I didn't really notice Neil Pionk. I didn't notice him being out there and, and, and being out of position and being in, in, vulnerable for the Winnipeg Jets. So when the benchmark for Neil Pionk is, well, he didn't hurt us, that tells you a little bit about where his game is at at this stage I did know, I, Although I will say, Drew, I did notice when he did lose a foot race to 39-year-old speedster Zach Parise. Well, I mean, that's never a good sign either. But, I mean, that's the problem with Logan Stanley at this point, and not, pardon me, Neil Pionk, is that he's lost some of his foot speed. I mean, his health is always going to be a question. And I don't he's think blaming me for this loss, by the way. Okay, well, they, it is your fault, Dave. I, 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 I mean, I, I, I thoroughly agree with Spency that it is your fault. I actually but, assumed it was Ezzy's fault, to be honest with you, because you know we did this post game show without Ezzy in Game One. The Jets won. Right. Then Ezzy joined us for Game Two, the Game Two and Three, and the Jets lost. So I thought, well, if Ezzy's not joining us, uh, then there's a good chance the Jets would win. But unfortunately, it shows that that is not the case. Yeah, it's, it's apparently it's not Ezzy. It's not the uh, Ezzy's not the deciding factor either. It, it, it's just a, a continual function of if you have to now deal with this Winnipeg, if you're looking forward to the off season now and the jets are still going to come out and they're going to try their damnedest to extend the series. And they, and, and that's going to be good. And look, make, make me eat my words, make me, you know, come back and win the series in seven and I'll have a nice plate of crow and I'll be glad to eat it here on the illegal curve post game show. I don't expect that to happen. I don't think that's realistic based on how we've watched the first four games, but at least your glaring areas of concern and the glaring areas that are going to need to be addressed are clear for all to see. You know where your areas of improvement are demand to be. Now, how you improve those areas, well, that's a separate issue entirely. And that'll be something that we talk about uh, you know, throughout the, the, the off-season editions of the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. But right now, it's clear that against the best teams in the Western Conference, you have glaring weaknesses that aren't going to be addressed and can't only be addressed through better depth with your forward group. Yeah, and you know, the one thing I, you know, to me, I, I saw it and I thought it was curious. When the Jets called the timeout and mm-hmm. you looked at the benches and the Avs bench, and they showed it on the television, right? Avs bench is completely, they're all in a group. They're all watching, they're watching the play being drawn up. The Jets were just out of it. The Jets were, were, were already checked out. And that to me was just, it wasn't a good sign. It wasn't a good sign from the players. Like, you know, again, this game was over. It was probably over at 3-1, but it was for sure over at 4-1. And I understand that the guys were already thinking about, but you still kind of needed to make a statement, right? Yeah. A statement that this game, you could you could do something in this period that you could draw on in theory. If what, what those who have played the game have said, if you can actually bring something forward, some sort of good habit, something that you've done, then you could bring it into the start of the next game in theory, as, as like I said, as they've said. But to me, what I found curious was just, I just couldn't believe, like I'm looking at the bench and I'm thinking to myself, you got one or two guys listening to Brad Lauer. And then if you look on the other bench, the entire abs bench, the for the body most part, language is bad. The body language. The bo- I'm just bad. saying, but, I'm, but it doesn't look good. It, again, like I said, like, and I understand the game's over and the guys are already like, you know, but it doesn't look good. It's, it's a, it's a poor reflection because the abs are, they're up 4-1. They're very comfortable, right? But instead, what do they do? They say, okay, well, let's just, let's make sure. Let's keep this tight. Let's not give them any momentum. The Jets just didn't seem interested. So I, again, just, that's what we do on the show. We make observations. And to me, that was an observation I didn't like to see. Fair enough. Uh, I want to give equal time. We I addressed the issue about pulling the goalie on the power play. Rick Bonus also addressed it. This is courtesy of our friend Connor Harabchuk, who of course has been on this show before and does a lot of work with our friends at Winnipeg Sports Talk. Rick Bonus was asked about the decision to not pull the goaltender during the Jets' late third period power play. Quote, I was kind of waiting to see how it went, but that power play looked good. They had chances. If the first half of that power play was really bad, then yeah, we would have called a timeout right there, pulled the goalie to try and get something going, but that power play looked really good, and their goalie made good saves. And I just think that's short-sighted. I mean, that's just uh, what I would say about that. I just think that is a... uh, 
a short-sighted mentality. It's not a killer instinct mentality. It's what, so, so you're thinking, well, if it works, then yeah, you know, great. But now if it doesn't work and, you know, uh, odds are it's not going to work when you just look at the success rates on power plays versus the, you know, versus the, the goal scoring rates, maybe the Jets penalty kill is the exception to that rule, but usually mm-hmm. a great penalty kill or a great power play, which the Jets have had so far in the playoffs succeeds 30% of the time. So, you know, three out of 10 times you're going to score and you'd be happy with that. You have to have more of a killer instinct here. You have to have more desperation. I'm just not sure what Rick Bonus is waiting for in that instance, waiting till the power play is half over. To me, you wouldn't wait till that power play is half over if it's a one goal game and there's a minute to go in the contest. You'd have it six on four immediately upon the faceoff. You're down 4-1 at this point. There's 12 minutes to go in the game or eight minutes to go in the game. Why aren't you going six on four immediately? To me, that is just a a mistake by the Jets coaching staff and in not taking a more aggressive attitude when the downside to aggression is nothing. The downside is absolutely nothing. The upside is 4-2 with, you know, maybe almost half of the third period to go as opposed to being the downside being five, one with, with, you know, eight minutes to go to me, that's a mistake by the Jets coaching staff right there. Yeah. And, and look, ultimately the coaches are to blame, right? You know, the players share a significant, you know, impact on the play of the game, but Rick bonus likes to take it on the chin for his team and say, well, Hey, it's me. I got to get these guys motivated. I got to get these guys ready to go. I have to have these guys prepared. Like I said to me, like even, you know, after the, the, like the Avs take the lead in the second period, and then who presses after they take the lead? You'd like to see a counterpunch. We didn't right. see a counterpunch. We saw the Avs continue to press. Right. And Connor Bell- Hellebuck got, got called upon. Yeah. So so for for from that perspective, Drew, it, it's well, just it's just a it's just another example of you know, and Mark Shifley, I don't know if you wanted to highlight his comments about the need for the Avs making adjustments and saying that the Jets aren't adjusting. And of course, like no offense, Mark Shifley, that's on you. Like you, you're a big part of this team. You're, you know, one of the leaders of this group. And so, you know, and obviously there were some, some, some lineup changes that we, we should probably talk about the fact that Nino Nita rider got moved up to the uh, second line. Nikolai yeah. Ehlers got moved down to the third line with Adam Lowry and Mason Appleton. And as we said, actually Johnson Fielby came in uh, initially at least and played on that fourth line with Alex Iafalo and Vlad Nemesnikov. So the only line that really was kind of untouched was that top line with, at, at least at first, was Shifley. Did. Yeah, I, I, like I said, at first was Shifley, Velarde, and Connor. And then eventually, of course, Velarde got punted from that one. And, you know, Gabriel Velarde, who we've been talking about, we've been lauding on when he's healthy, how big of an impact he's been on this team. And he's a, he's a relatively young guy from a playoff perspective. I don't know. I can't even, I don't even know how many playoff games he's played. Uh, I don't think it would be very many, though. Drew, if you could uh, fact check me on that one. Right. But, you know, at the end of the day, like, you know, like I said, get, like Tyler DeFoley, uh, Gabriel Velarde, Sean Monahan, those are the guys, Nikolai Ehlers, Cal Connor. Mm-hmm. Those are the guys that need to produce. Like, you want to, of course, if you can get a goal from Alex Iafalo, if you can get a goal from Nino Niederreiter, if you can get a goal from Mason Appleton, the Avs are getting those kind of goals. Yeah. The Avs are definitely getting that. So, and the Jets aren't getting that, but they're also, and that, that'd be, you'd be like, okay, well, it's not really sustainable to go to win 16 games without any depth scoring, but you also need your primary scoring to produce and they're not doing it. Like one goal, this game, two goals, the last game, two goals, the game before that, how is that enough to win? And I mean, again, it may be if you're staying disciplined, because again, Connor Hellebuck has been fine at five on five. Sure. So, I mean, if you can stay undisciplined and you can, and you can, keep the goal the games low scoring that's one thing drew but if you're not going to stay disciplined and you're only scoring one or two goals a game i don't see how you win those games no i mean and for the record for the record you don't because you're now down three one in the series (laughs) that's just it i mean you don't have a chance at that point in time it's just it's too much to ask um you know for for the jets to to take that many penalties especially given their 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 
uh, their lack, their, their lackluster penalty kill. I mean, it's, it's, it's not, it's not that difficult. It's not that much of rocket science. Connor Hellbuck did everything in his power to keep the Winnipeg Jets in this one. Which goal don't you like? I mean, this be, you know, let's break it down for you. If you're a, if you're a Hellbuck hater and you're saying that this is on Connor Hellbuck, despite the fact that the Jets only mustered one goal, which goal don't you like? The first goal, which is a bad giveaway by Logan Stanley, uh, and, and then Nate Schmidt is caught puck watching and loses Arturi Lekkinen. I mean, you're going to blame Connor Hellebuck for that one. I mean, I don't think that's fair if you are, but all the power to you if you think that's the way you want to go with it. You know, are, are you blaming him for the great tip in by Val Nachushkin on the power play goal that goes post and in a terrific tip in? Are you blaming him on that one? Are you blaming him on the Kale McCarr one? Well, maybe. Maybe you don't love the Kale McCarr goal. But all I'm seeing there, more than a, a more than a, a, something you can fault the goaltender with, is an unbelievable play by the best defenseman in the NHL. I mean, that's you know that was Bobby Orr esque, and I know that we've heard too many comparisons between McCarr and Orr and everything else because I'm sick of hearing it as well. I get you, folks. But he started that play 200 feet away. You know, Adam Lowry goes for an uncharacteristic stick check rather than angling Makar or using the body. He just sort of whiffs on him. And then Makar is off to the races. And, you know, he he's it, it, it's a great shot. I understand maybe you need to see Hellebuck make that save. But Hellebuck has made so many saves already to keep you afloat that this one, inevitably something's going to go in if you don't step up your game from the Jet skaters perspective. And they didn't. And so that's, mm -hmm. you know, you got 3-1 at that point in time. 4-1, do you have a problem with the 4-1 goal? Well, he makes the first save. It's a penalty It's a penalty kill situation. And then Alex Ayafalo is maybe a little bit late to come back and uh, get the rebound before Nachushkin does. You're telling me that's that's Hellebuck's fault again? I, I You know, I, I don't know what the expect the, the, re, the realistic expectation is for the Jets goaltender when the team in front of them can't stay out of the penalty box, can't kill a penalty, and of course, gives up four and, and scores one goal on their own, Dave. It's just I don't know what the uh, I just don't know what the, rea the, the realistic is there. I I would absolutely agree with you. And now we don't have to do a post game show a game recap because you've just recapped all the goals. But uh, yeah, Drew, I mean it's it goaltending isn't the issue. I know that no, folks look. It's not Connor Hellebuck hasn't been otherworldly. It's not like the it's not like that game against mm -hmm. the Predators where they, they had seventeen scoring chances and he won't. Pretty much single handedly. Danger chances were 14 to 4 at 5 on 5, Dave. 14 yeah. to 4 at 5 on 5, which means he's made 12 out of 14 high danger chances at well, 5 on 5 in this game. Again, like I said, he's not your problem. I'm not, I'm not sitting here gonna advocate that I believe that. I don't. And I what did I say 10 minutes ago when this? I mean, we've already we're already 40 minutes in, Drew. We're fired up. It's 40 minutes into the show, and you know, over 500 people are in the chat on YouTube, another 500 on Twitter. We're loving you guys all joining us and girls joining us here on the Illegal Curve post game show. But my point is that I wouldn't say it's Hellebuck. I would just say it's it's the differences in this game is the fact that right now it's the Jets aren't creating. They're not matching the intensity that the Avs have brought. But yeah, I mean it's it's the if it's an easy one to to look at the score at the end of the day and to say the Jets lost the games by seven, you know, they, they have scored seven, they have scored six, they have scored six, they have scored five and be like, well, that's obviously a goaltending situation. And that'd be a very superficial way of looking at it and, and a very simple way of looking at it. But I think it just doesn't do anyone any justice to, to actually look at that and say, like, again, you want to say that Lauren Brassois looked calm and cool and collected in the net guys. Like, let's be realistic. Do you really think the abs were, were, were trying in that third period? To like, let's test Lauren Brassois. Like it's, it's not, it's not, you can say the Jets look more comfortable. Like again, everyone here in the chat is watching the same game that we're watching. And sometimes I'm not, not sure about that. <laughs> well, no, but I mean like, and look, everybody has their own biases and their own yeah. way of viewing things. So, I mean, and there's no one superior way, except for maybe my way, but there's no one superior way to doing it. But all I'm going to say is the notion that the Jets play, like, this is not, I understand where this comes from. I remember when when the Jets used to have Pavlectricity, Andre Pavlik in net, and you the the team or Steve Mason or even David Riddick. David Riddick is probably the best one, even though I'm mispronouncing his last name. Because the fact of the matter is, when he was in net, the Jets didn't look the Jets didn't look comfortable. They never they always looked a little bit nervous because you never knew what was going to happen with you know no save Dave. So so I understood that. But I mean now I'm seeing that sort of notion with Connor Hellebuck. I'm thinking to myself like. 
he's not the issue. And there's no, I'm not like a Connor Hellebuck, like there's no Connor Hellebuck jersey in my closet. There's a Pat LaFontaine jersey in my closet, but there's no Connor Hellebuck jersey in my closet. Why yeah. a Pat LaFontaine jersey? Um, no reason. A buddy of mine gave it to me. So that was, uh, that's it. But, but anyways, the point is that, uh, that I'm just saying that he is the least of the problems right now. Like, look like Drew, let's go through the, I don't have it pulled up. You probably have the Winnipeg Jets stats. Read off the number of goals that have been scored by the players on this team. Uh, Hang on. Give me a second. to. to Okay. Well, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'll look at, I'll look it up right now, but I'm just, I'm, what am I, I guess the, the, your point is clear that they're not scoring enough goals aside from game one. They haven't, you know, go through it. Aside from game one, take game one out of the equation. How many goals does this team score? Five. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, that's not enough. I don't care who your goalie is. I don't care if your goaltender is is an amalgam of Ken Dryden and Vladislav Tretiak. Mark Mark Shifley, two goals, Kyle Connor, two goals, Josh Morrissey, two goals, Uh, Gabriel Velarde, none. Adam, Adam Lowry, two goals. Nino Nita Ryder, zero goals. Mason Appleton, zero goals. Uh, let's keep going down. Sean Monahan, zero goals. Nikolai Ehler, zero goals. Alex Ifalo, zero goals. Um, and it goes on and on. So, I mean, my point I think I'm trying to make is that while the goaltending hasn't been, he hasn't been otherworldly, he's still been good, as Drew mentioned, right? 12 of the 14 high danger chances he faced five on five. He made those stops. But if you don't get goal scoring in the playoffs, it won't matter. It doesn't matter at all. You're absolutely right about that, Dave. M. It doesn't matter at all if you don't get the goal scoring. The Jets aren't getting the goal scoring. They only got the one goal in tonight's game, which makes it a really easy, and with apologies to Kale McCarr, I'm going to give it to Nate Schmidt because it's his first career playoff goal for the member of the Winnipeg Jets. That's our Seagram shot of the game. The Seagram shot of the game. Big thanks to our friends at Seagram's for their continued support of the Illegal Curve post-game show. Perhaps you're hitting the bottle as a result of the Jets' performance as of late. If you are doing so, we recommend any of the fantastic Seagram's products. Perhaps you're going to go with Seagram's 83, Manitoba's favorite Canadian whiskey. If that's your choice, we encourage that, but we also encourage you to, of course, please drink responsibly. Big thanks to our friends at Seagram's for their continued support of the Illegal Curve post-game show just gonna sl- slide in this comment from mike mcintyre when the winnipeg free press who's in denver he just tweeted this out and i want to make this uh, mention here on the show i'll say this here in denver the jets not only look like a team with no answers but sound like one too nothing we just heard from mark shifley nino niederreiter or in brackets especially rick bonus inspires hope that this can get turned around so uh that's i mean and, and look Media interviews, as much as we like to think that they're significant and they're important, they can mean nothing. These guys can go out, win 5-1 in the next game. And if they do, come back here and, you know, congratulate me for getting it right, Kreskin. But ultimately, that, you know, like I said, that's, it's just, I think it's another reflection. I mean, Mike's an observer and he's giving you an observation that he's picking up on from, you know, he's been in Denver for three or four days, giving you uh, coverage of this team for the Winnipeg Free Press. So, yeah, this is, uh, it sounds like a defeated group. It sounds like a group without answers. And uh, they're going to need to figure some out because I think Rick Bonus said it, and I believe he meant it. And he said, look, you know, four very good teams are going to go home after the first round. And he's not wrong about that. Four but very he, good Western Conference teams is what he was. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Of course, obviously, there's more. Well, four teams. Three very good teams in the Los Angeles Kings, I would say. Yes, I would agree with that. But <laughs> but I would just say that. I oh, made his, myself laugh. <laughs> but his the fact is that he what he what was he what he said and I mentioned this yesterday or Saturday yeah, yesterday on the show was that as long as you can say you gave all the effort you needed to give in right. order to to show that hey you know what a week after this series ends whenever that is you're not looking back going I could have given more I could have given more now we went through a laundry list of players who can clearly still give more Drew and mm-hmm. are still going to need to show some you know, give a shit on Tuesday and some pushback and whatever other language you want to use. But again, like I said, that's, you know, a little bit ahead because we still have to get through game four. Well, and you know, on Tuesday for game five, look, I mean, we remember the, the, we remember the end of season comments from Rick bonus and they ring very loud right now. And the jets look are, are unlikely to win this series. I think I can, I, I think the stats would bear that out. Even if you don't like my, my opining, my opining that uh, comment, but mm-hmm. the jets on Tuesday to prove that they're more than they were last year need to 
show the fight. They need to show the fight that they didn't show in Vegas last year in game five. You're playing that game five at home. That's you right. want to have a performance that your fans can be proud of. And yes, it's an uphill climb, and yet, but it starts with one game at a time. It starts with one shift at a time. It starts with one period at a time. And that has to be the mindset on Tuesday night. Because if you come out and you do, I mean, if you have a performance akin to what the Toronto Maple Leafs did on home ice last night, mm -hmm. you know, where they get booed off the ice because of how awful they looked and how they had their best players, their core four, sniping at each other on the bench, you know, mm -hmm. think about, you know, it, it won't garner the national attention that it will because it's Toronto with the Leafs. But think about how the offseason will look for the Jets, you know, if, if they lay an egg on home ice on Tuesday night. It won't look very good after what has been a season that has largely been fun and filled with positive attitude and promise. Think so about it, Drew. 52 of the playoff of the regular season games ended with wins, right? Yeah. I mean, that's a significant number given – you know, when you look at it, 52 of the 82. So, um, and they weren't all Picassos. They weren't all games they deserve to win. But I'm just saying, like, you're right. It has been a fun season. It's been a lot of fun. Jets fans are enraged. Playoffs, you know, create a different animal. We know we've definitely got some abs folks in the chat as well, having some fun. So keep it fun, folks. Keep having good times. Remember, it's not life or death. Right. And we appreciate the dedication that you have joining us after every single game. The place to be. For Jets fans, after every game, win, lose, or I see Drew. Thank you. Right there is the Leo I got, some, post game I, got show. Some, I got some baby pictures I can pull out after the break well, if you want to see those. Sorry, that one right there is from, from when I was a little kid. My okay. David's room. So uh, there we go. But yeah, this is uh, this I was, is even, I was cuter as a kid than I am now, if you believe that, folks. And I, I know do how good it. I am right now. So why don't we do that? We'll go to break. Maybe we won't bring out the baby pictures, but I'll see if I can grab some. <laughs> again. We'll bring, come back with the tough duck, hardest hitting comment. We'll do a little bit more of a game for recap. The Jets, they're up against it. They lose this afternoon in Denver by a 5-1 margin. They trail in the season, in the series now, three games to one, do or die Tuesday night at home for the Jets against the Avalanche. Drew Mandel, Dave Manuk with you on a Sunday afternoon. This is the Illegal Curve post game show you guys ever wish for a game changer in life like finding out your favorite snack has zero calories or discovering the mute button on ezzy picture this a secret weapon for parking where you can book a spot a whole month in advance tell me more drew pre-book your parking at really low rates or maybe even for free if you use the code illegal curve <laughs> free what is this sorcery the Grid Park app. It's a real secret weapon that has affordable game day parking. And to sweeten the deal even more. I love sweets. Our listeners can use the code illegal curve to park for free. Holy Zamboni. Tell me about it. Just download Grid Park, G R Y D Park, and use the code illegal curve, all one word, to park for free. Whoa, Ezzy. Everything okay? You look stressed. Of course I'm stressed. We're moving, the house is upside down, the kids failed miserably at packing the fine china, and my life is in chaos. Chaos! Yes, that does sound like a problem. What am I going to do? Ezzy, relax. Rolly's transfer moving and storage is the answer. With 60 years of experience in moving Manitobans and a track record of exemplary customer service, one call to Rollies and your stress is gone. No job is too big or too small. Just visit Rollies.com and they will take it from there. Thanks, Dave. And thank you, Rollies Transfer Moving and Storage, online at Rollies.com. <laughs> your coworkers love you because you always make them laugh. You're the life of the party with stories that have them rolling on the floor. Or maybe you're just the quiet one in the corner with the one-liners that just slay. Do you have what it takes to become Winnipeg's funniest person with a day job? Try your luck. Hit the stage at Rumors Comedy Club, and you could be walking away with $1,000 cash. Winnipeg's funniest person with a day job. Presented by Rumors. For all the details, head to RumorsComedyClub.com. The game can change ah! just like that. Accidents happen when you aren't protected. So now what? Getting to your injury quickly can make all the difference. Help prevent them from being game changers with Linden Market Dental Center. 
bonding, crowns, bridges, and dental implants. State-of-the-art treatments are available to help you get back in the game. To learn more, visit LindenMarketDentalCenter.com. Creating smiles for life. It's all over, folks, and the run has come to an end. You're so far away. A Canadian team hasn't won the cup in over 30 years. And the cup will stay south of the border. Maybe it's time we try something different. This playoff season, let's cheer with the fans we've always cheered against. Team up for the cup at Boston Pizza. For three generations and over 80 years, Tough Duck has been making apparel that works and plays as hard as the people who wear it. From jackets to work boots and everything in between, Tough Duck's clothing can handle the harshest environments, even the illegal curve hockey show. Work to live, live to play. Visit toughduck.com. Welcome back to the Illegal Curve post game show. Drew Mandel, Dave Manuk. It took my parents uh, the entirety of the commercial break to find some childhood photos of me. Hang on, maybe I'll turn this light off, see if that uh, helps. Uh, there's me uh, with a dog. I don't know whose dog that is. Dave is hating every second of this, I can assure you. No, I'm you. tweeting. I'm not actually watching the thing. Okay, so there's, <laughs> there's me as a, as a youngin with a dog. I'm not sure. Oh, hang on, let me flip this thing over again as well. There's also me. Um, I was really quite an adorable little child there, if you really think about it. There's another it's not really clear, Drew. Well, it's pretty clear. I mean, I can get the hang there. On we the go. Camera. There we go. Hold it up. There you go. Look at that. The good head of hair I had. Unfortunately, yeah. it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, this is me seemingly giving a gift to some child. I'm not entirely certain who that other child is, but uh, I hope they don't <laughs> mind. Spency says he's here for no more Jets talk. He's here for the Mandel memoirs. I can, I, I, I can some bar mitzvah photos also if you want. Uh, this is a bit of a scandalous one. I'm going with the short, short look on this one. I'm not really thinking what's happening uh, on this photo as well. But uh, as you Louis, can see, Louis, Louis Batista wants to know if you still live at home. <laughs> I don't still live at home. Uh, somehow I, I got somebody to marry me. That's the, that's the most surprising part of, uh, of tonight's activities. Uh, so anyways, uh, all right, we've seen that photo. Move here, on, but, yeah, There you go. So there's some uh, childhood photos of me and a good reminder why I don't frequently do this show uh, from my parents' house because it's a reminder that they don't otherwise have any photos photos of me regularly available so that's always <laughs> although great. although drew to be clear if we're going to go back into history of this fine program or it's true the precursor it started here to this my fine, parents knows. precursor to this fine program where we started after the death of 1290 uh thank god that uh we began <laughs> at uh you were well i should say we began but you we're doing the show at your parents, so it's true. So it's it's although you were in the basement, I believe not. Uh, it's not true. Yet. I have graduated up to my yeah. uh, to up to the main. Yeah, they're floor. now letting you. They're now letting you be on the main floor, which is very nice of them. Yes, that that is very nice of them. So there you have it. There's some uh, childhood pictures of me to uh, hopefully soften the disappointment that was tonight's Jets performance. Uh, the Jets obviously losing tonight 5-1 against the Colorado Avalanche, trying to find their way back into the series on Tuesday night. William wants to know if you're going to show any of your childhood pictures as well, or or is that? Uh, uh, do you have any handy on that front? I mean, you're not at least at least you're not at your parents' house, so it would be weird I if you sort of kept a, yeah, a baby picture around at all times. Hmm. I will. Well, maybe I'll save it for the next game. Well, no, because game six, game five, I'll be at the arena. That's true. Game. Well, you should bring them with you to the arena. I'm sure everybody yeah, there will be. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just, that. yeah. Judy Owen beside us. That's fine. I can, do, I can figure <laughs> that out. Exactly right. Again, reminder in case anybody, or just uh, as an update in case anybody uh, just joining us, Vlad Nemesnikov went to the hospital after taking that slap shot uh, to the face. We don't yet know his status. Uh, I'm not sure if he went to the hospital for x-rays or to get stitched up or what precisely it was, but he did uh, go to the hospital after taking that vicious slap shot to the face. And obviously we wish him nothing but the best. Brendan Dillon uh, was not in the Jets lineup after suffering that s skate cut. He, they say day to day, but I think everybody's day to day at this yeah. point of the season. So time will tell on Tuesday. If uh, he is back in the Jets lineup, we heard from Rick bonus. It sounds like that Cole Perfetti is likely to make his playoff debut on Tuesday night in game five. So you're going to see some lineup changes for the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, you know, I don't know what that's going to necessarily do, but you might as well try something new at this point and uh, at this point in time, because you're down three, one, 
if you lose on Tuesday, there is no more tomorrow. So there's no point in uh, keeping your powder dry uh, for a potential game six until you win game five. No, there's no question about it. And we don't, we won't know what those moves are until we, we see, I don't know the schedule. See, that's very unusual. Normally I can give folks a kind of some insight as to what the schedule looks like, but we usually don't get that message till the, the jets will send out a, a text to the folks in the media and the, on the chat. And we'll kind of get an idea as to what the next day is going to look like. Right. Uh, Cause obviously they try and, you know, figure it out and kind of depend, move, things move around. So we'll find out. And again, that'll be in the notes on illegalcreative.com in tomorrow's morning papers. If you're curious as to what is going to happen, they most likely will have a media availability. I will also be doubling doing media availabilities with the moose because they're, of course their season ended last Thursday and uh, they're doing kind of a, I'm not really sure why, but a Monday to Wednesday uh, media session. So uh, it's like over the course of three days, which is lovely, three days out of the ice block, that should be fun. But uh, yeah, we'll see what that has. But hey, we'll be talking to Colby Barlow tomorrow for anyone, Chaz Lucius and a few others. Uh, let's see, anybody else of interest for Jets fans? Dylan Anhorn and Connor Levis. So, and Danny Jilkin. So four or five uh, Jets prospects I'll talk to tomorrow. And that'll be up on our YouTube channel. So keep a lock on that. And of course, on illegalcurve.com. There you go. Dave doing garbage bag day for the Manitoba Moose. We want to remind everybody, of course, with game five on Tuesday night back in Winnipeg, that means another edition, possibly the final edition, we shall see, of the Illegal Curve pregame show. That'll come to you live from City Place, downtown Winnipeg, second floor in the food court, prior to game five between the Jets and the Avalanche. So that should, with game time being... uh, 8.30, which probably means closer to 8.50, the pregame show will run from 6.30 to 8 o'clock. So join us on Tuesday evening at City Place. Big thanks to City Place for their support and for their uh, initiative that has brought the Illegal Curve pregame show to fruition. But we'll be live in the food court 6.30 to 8 on Tuesday night for the Illegal Curve pregame show. And then after the game, the Illegal Curve postgame show, where we will either be talking about a potential game six on Thursday night, or we'll be talking about the end of the regular, uh, the end of the Winnipeg Jets season. One or the other. William, we'll find wants, to out. Know, William wants to know for booking tea times. Well, I hate golfing, William, so not me. I'm not booking any tea times just yet uh, because I think the weather report for Tuesday doesn't look great. But if somebody wants to take me golfing, I'm always happy to accept an invitation to go golfing, but I'm not yet booking my own tea times. Folks were golfing out at my main, my main course when I do golf, which KP frequently KP. So I saw some folks out at KP shout out KP. There you go. Dave M loves, uh, (laughs) Dave M loves the train track uh, hole. Do you go, do you go over or do you go under? Well, my intention is always to go over but my <laughs> more, more, my reality is oftentimes under or into the woods or, yeah. you know, Not hitting one of the joggers running down the path <laughs> on the left-hand side. Look, it was their fault for being behind you anyways. If they didn't want to get hit by that golf ball, they should have known it was going to ricochet off a tree and smack them in the head behind you. That's their own fault. And as a result, you should feel no guilt over that, uh, Dave Manouk. Uh, we'll felt. wrap up the post-game show with the Tough Duck hardest hitting comment. The Tough Duck Hardison in Common. We're going to give tonight's Tough Duck hardest hitting comment to Robert Palmer. Robert is frequently in the chat, if I'm not mistaken. His comment came in late during the the post game show, but nonetheless, it was a good one. This next game will show us what we are made of. The Jets are still in the dance. If you quit on your team, you don't deserve to wear that jersey you put on. Side note, Perfetti needs to play. Well, Robert's probably going to get his wish based on the comments that Rick Bonus made about Cole Perfetti and the likelihood he'll be in the lineup for Game 5 between the Jets and the Colorado Avalanche. Robert, congratulations. You've won a a tough duck trucker hat. Now that the weather has turned warmer, we don't give away toques. We give away trucker hats. So send me an email, drew at illegalcurve.com with your mailing address or slide into my DMs at IC Drew and our friends at Tough Duck will hook you up with that great prize. Congratulations to Robert. Congratulations to everybody who has won the Tough Duck hardest hitting comment, the 85, 86 now times we have given away here on the Illegal Curve post game show. Oh, and actually to that end, Drew, again, yep. remember folks, for those who are going on Tuesday, and I know that some folks are, are are upset, but hey, 
You know what can make things a little bit easier? Your Ooh, Winnipeggers. I, I know. I know. What, what is it? Is it free parking from Grid Park? It is free parking from Grid Park. Woo-hoo. So I've still got, I've still, we've had some people reach out. Dave at illegalcurve.com or I see Dave send me a DM on Twitter or just send me a message on Twitter if you can't DM me and let me know if you want to go. What is this? This is just me playing with a sprinkler there. If you see that, I'm very excited <laughs> about that sprinkler. Well, there you go. But if forget about Drew Sprinkler, we're going to, we're going to make it tinkle when you sprinkle <laughs> because you're going to be getting free parking from grid park for uh, Tuesday's game five here in Winnipeg. So uh, send me a message. I see Dave or Dave at illegalcurve.com and we'll hook you guys up. And like I said, I've probably got four or five left. We can, we, I'm not going to say we're going to get rid of them all because you know, you want to have a little faith. Maybe you'll need them for Saturday night game seven downtown Winnipeg. But for now for game five, if you want to go to the game and park for free, uh, hit me up with a, with an email and we'll send you a code. That would be wild if there was a game seven. Obviously, that would be, I would suggest, unexpected at this point in time. But stranger things have happened. The Jets will have to dig deep to make it a to a game six before they can de- think about a game seven. And it all starts on One Tuesday game at a time, night. Drew. What's that? One, playing the role of Ezzy. I'm interrupting you. One game at a time. Thank you. I appreciate you interrupting me and playing the role of Ezzy. I, I was worried that some nobody was going to do it in the course of uh, in the course of tonight's post game show. A uh, big thank you to all the sponsors of Illegal Curve who make the post game show, the Saturday show, the website a possibility. That's our friends at Rumors Restaurant and Comedy Club. In case you didn't, in case you missed it in yesterday's Winnipeg Free Press, a great article on the forty years that Rumors has been bringing Winnipeg the best in stand up comedy. So congratulations to our friends at Rumors for that wonderful milestone check that out in yesterday's winnipeg free press and online on the winnipeg free press website dave reminded people grid park you can use code illegal curve to park for free email dave he'll hook you up for tuesday night or any night when you head downtown and need to use some grid park parking our friends at linden market dental center zapia group realty tough duck they had the hardest hitting comment boston pizza i think they're still recovering from the illegal curve watch party and post game show that happened on friday Boy, was that a lot of fun. Our friends at Seagram's, Rolly's Transfer, and Farmery Beer support these fine businesses because of their continued support of illegal curve hockey. For anybody that wants to stick around, I'm going to keep going through more baby pictures. But if you completely understand, if you want to go and maybe spend some more time with your loved ones or your family members on this Sunday evening, rather than watch that. We appreciate everyone joining us tonight for the Illegal Curve post game show. If you haven't already done so, smash the like button, subscribe to the YouTube channel, subscribe to the podcast, leave us feedback, leave us feedback here, there. Always want to feedback on the com- on the podcast as well, and rate us and review us because that helps with the algorithm. I don't know what that means, but it sounds good, so I like to say it nonetheless. We'll be back Tuesday evening, the Illegal Curve pregame show, 6.30 p.m., the Illegal Curve postgame show after game five. IllegalCurve.com is, of course, going to be updated with all your latest Winnipeg Jets. And tomorrow, Manitoba Moose news, audio, video, the whole they're gi- enchilada. They're giving, me, Drew, they're giving me three days to uh, create content, so I'm not going to complain about that. I guess I was thinking about it. Do I want to just do it all in one day? No, this gives me three, although I don't know how I'm going to do it on Tuesday when it's a Jets game day, but we'll figure that out. You'll clone yourself. You got you got 48 hours to figure that out. So something yeah. to go ahead and do. Thanks, everyone, for joining us uh, all weekend long. It's been great. Have a great rest of your Sunday. We'll see you Tuesday evening. For Dave Manouk, I'm your host, Drew Mandel. This has been the Illegal Curve Post Game Show. Thanks for listening to this broadcast from Illegal Curve Hockey. For more great Illegal Curve content, subscribe to the Illegal Curve YouTube channel, follow at Illegal Curve on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, And visit your online home for hockey in Winnipeg, IllegalCurve.com.